All right, uh, welcome everybody. Let's go ahead and get started here. Uh, we'll revisit these announcements. Remember that the introductory assignment's due tomorrow by 11. I think maybe a handful of you have already finished that, so uh, that's great. Uh, your first calculation assignment is due on Tuesday, and we're going to cover a couple of uh, ideas, and I'll show you some equations that you need to be familiar with for that assignment. Now, of course, Monday is a holiday, so I won't be in the office on Monday, but I will try and check my email a couple of times over the weekend uh, in case there are any questions. Um, my little microphone's broken at the moment, so I'm going to be using this webcam for audio, so the quality of the recording, the, the sound quality may not, I mean, it's never great, maybe even worse. So I apologize for that. You'll have to maybe just uh, remember what I said today, I guess. Right. So any questions on the announcements? All right, we're going to continue talking about flow resistance, which is what we started with on Tuesday and then also talk about some different ways to classify flow and velocity distribution. But before we do that, let's uh, take a step back to fluid mechanics. And uh, remember that um, of the two, you first learned Bernoulli's equation. And um, what's the main difference between Bernoulli's equation and the energy equation? Because they have a lot of the same terms. Headlock. Exactly right. So the, uh, the, the energy equation accounts for energy loss between the two points. So we use Bernoulli's equation in situations like that uh, expanding pipe section where there's a change in diameter and so the velocity is in this case decreasing. And we had some limitations on how broadly we could apply Bernoulli's equation. Remember, the restriction said that Bernoulli's equation was valid for steady flow, for an incompressible, inviscid fluid along a streamline. And, um, and so those limitations about it being an inviscid, an inviscid fluid was all about the fact that Bernoulli's equation has no way to account for pipe friction and energy loss due to uh, shear stress of the pipe resisting the movement of the water. So Bernoulli's equation is kind of blind to the fact that as the water flows from left to right, the pipe is pushing back against the water from the right towards the left. So we couldn't deal with that limitation. I mean, it's okay. Bernoulli's equation is okay as long as the two points you're applying it uh, over are relatively close together because two points that are close together won't experience much friction loss. But when the two pipes are far, when the two locations are far apart, like this, uh, this image on the right, Bernoulli's equation would say that there's no pressure change in a section like this because if there's no change in velocity, Bernoulli's equation says that the two pressures should be the same. But through measurement down in the lab, uh, you notice that even for a one meter section with relatively uh, fritzy equipment, you can still measure a pressure drop across one meter length. And so now consider how far it is from your house to the drinking water treatment plant. There's going to be a lot of energy loss there. So we had to come up with some way to account for the energy loss. And what was the equation that you used in that lab where we were utilizing the pipe rack? You remember the name, the name of that equation? Was it good? That's the one we're going to use this semester most Hayes often. Williams. Hayes and Williams. Right. There's... Um, there's three main equations that are still used today, and there are some older historical ones. But a big part of our class this semester is trying to find out how we can predict the pressure change for a pipe network. And we're going to be using different empirical equations to predict that energy loss. What's attractive about the Hayes and Williams equation, as you learned, is in theory, the friction factor C should be the same, regardless of pipe diameter, regardless of flow conditions. And so that makes it pretty easy to apply. Um, the disadvantage is that it's not as accurate as some other methods. And so that's what really is the main uh, objective of the next couple of lectures, is talking about these different empirical equations that predict pressure change due to pipe friction. So these are empirical equations and 
Um, recall that our definition of a piezometer is something that can be used to measure the hydraulic grade line. And there are two terms that go into uh, calculating or even graphing the hydraulic grade line. There's the pressure head term and the elevation term. And uh, the energy grade line, remember, is the hydraulic grade line plus one other term. The energy grade line also includes the velocity head. So EGL is HGL plus V squared divided by 2G. Now here, the water level is going to rise to a certain height. And however high the water is, that is the hydraulic grade line at that point. And so we can tell from this sketch that the water is flowing from the left towards the right. If the water was stagnant and if there was no flow velocity, things would look different. The water levels would be the same on this uh, piezometer tap on the left, the piezometer tap on the right. Right now, the, the water level on the right is a little bit lower. And so that's an indication that we have head loss due to pipe friction. And so if there's more energy on the left than there is on the right, that tells us the water is flowing from left to right. Now the fact that this pipe is inclined has nothing to do with the water levels that we see. If Think about now if it was static conditions. So if the water wasn't flowing through the pipe, then the water, would be, the water level would be at the same on the left piezometer and the right piezometer, even if we tipped the tubes back and forth. The main pipe, if we lowered one side and raised the other, that wouldn't have any effect on the water level inside the piezometer. The piezometer only uh, has a difference in height if the water is flowing. So this is the H sub F. Obviously the flow is left to right mm -hmm. for that to happen, right? That's correct. Thank you. So um, if, we, if we say the HGL is these two terms, so the change in HGL is this head loss due to pipe friction. And the most accurate way we have to model it is the Darcy-Wiesbach equation. And so the friction factor F, which we'll spend uh, a lot of time talking about how we calculate that. We've already, in the last lecture, re revisited the Moody diagram. That's a quick graphical way of estimating the F value. We also have some equations that uh, remove the need to consult a figure. So we can put some equations into Excel, for example, or in a computer, and then, <coughs> excuse me, and then you don't have to stop and each time consult the figure. So uh, the energy loss between two points is a function of the friction factor, the pipe length L, the velocity term squared, divided by the diameter, and then 2g. So the Darcy-Wiesbach equation is just derived from the idea that the hydraulic grade line um, can be traced with these piezometers. And we know that the height difference, h sub f, if you double the length, then you double the <laughs> h sub f. And if you doubled the velocity, then you'd actually have uh, four times as much energy loss because you can see that the the head loss due to pipe friction is a function of velocity squared. And if you make the pipe diameter smaller, then that increases the energy loss and that's why it's down in the uh, denominator term of the Darcy-Wiesbach equation. So I just wanted to remind you kind of uh, where the Darcy-Wiesbach equation comes from, uh, but before we get to use this beautiful equation, let's revisit some of the ones that are a little bit less accurate. Um, now remember that if we have an enclosed pipe, the water is flowing under pressure, then the slope of the pipe can be different from the slope of the energy grade line. And so S0 is the term for pipe slope. That's the physical slope of the, of the pipe. And S sub F is the term for the slope of the energy grade line. Um, and so what that means is that we can have a pipe that's going uphill like this and if the water is flowing from left to right then the water level would rise higher on the piezometer on the left than the one on the right and so here's our delta h sub f 
This is the energy lost due to pipe friction. So the, the delta Z is the energy lost due to pipe friction. And so the fact that the pipe is inclined doesn't say anything about the slope of the energy grade line. So here's S0, the slope of the pipe. It could be uphill, it can be downhill, it can be horizontal. But the slope of the energy grade line, S sub F, is independent of the pipe. OK, uh, your homework assignment asks you to calculate the shear velocity for a, a couple of problems. And I wanted to explain a little bit about what the shear velocity is. Um, now, in class on Tuesday, we said that the head loss due to pipe friction can be expressed in terms of shear stress. The shear stress is the resistance that the pipe is, uh, is putting on the water. It's the resistance to flow on a unit area basis. And so the units of shear stress are newtons per meter squared. And so when, we, when we're doing that force balance, and we wanted to find out the number of newtons of force of resistance, then we had to integrate it over the, the pipe area, so some length in the perimeter. But the shear stress itself can be related due to, uh, to the pipe friction. And remember here that R is hydraulic radius. And so that's the area divided by the wetted perimeter. Does anybody remember what's the quick way to estimate the, well, not estimate, it's to calculate the hydraulic radius for a pipe where the water is flowing full through a circular pipe? Good, that's right. D divided by 4. Because area is pi d squared divided by 4. And wetted perimeter is just the circumference around the outside of that pipe. And so it's pi d. So hydraulic radius for a pipe that's flowing full is d divided by 4. So if we combine this relationship of shear stress and pipe friction, along with the Darcy-Wiesbach equation, which is our empirical attempt to describe pipe friction head loss. This is just an empirical approximation that relies on this mystical friction factor F. So if we combine them together, we can rearrange and uh, cancel out like terms and simplify. And this is what we end up with, is a term that on the left side has shear stress and fluid density and on the right has the friction factor and the velocity. Uh, and what this tells us, this relationship, is that the friction factor is directly proportional to the boundary shear stress. So in other words, if the uh, shear stress goes up, then so does the friction factor. And that makes sense that you know, what's causing the shear stress is it's just a natural resistance to flow. And so by increasing the velocity through the pipe, the shear stress that's resisting the fluid movement increases. And the way that we're going to account for that empirically, you know, we have to have some equation that accounts for the fact that the shear stress is higher. Because we can't go in there like with the ruler and measure the shear stress. It, it's not as easy as uh, you can't directly measure it in a live environment. Instead, we want to predict in advance what the effect of that shear stress is going to be. And so this empirical equation is our way of trying to approximate the effect of the shear stress. And so what it says is that shear stress and friction factor are directly proportional. They both increase at the same rate. Now let's look at the units of shear stress divided by density. And so the units of shear stress are newtons per meter squared. And then density, of course, is kilograms per cubic meter. And so this term is just inverting, the, since it's in the denominator. So kilograms per cubic meter. So if we now break down the newtons into its uh, fundamental units, a, a newton is a kilogram meter per second squared. And then we still have these meters squared from before. So that's what this one is. And then keeping the units of density, kilograms per cubic meter. And now if we cancel everything out that's like, we've got meters to the fourth in the numerator, meters to the second in the denominator, and so that leaves us with meters squared. The kilograms both cancel out, and then we've got seconds squared. And so someone along the way recognized, hey, 
meter squared and seconds squared, we could express this relationship of the uh, shear velocity in terms of uh, units of velocity, meters per second, if we took the square root of it. And so shear velocity squared is shear stress divided by density. And so therefore, if something is just asking you to calculate the shear velocity, what you do is you take the square root of the shear stress and the fluid's density. It's kind of an abstract idea that doesn't have a lot of everyday practical application, but um, if you're looking at material strengths, then the uh, shear velocity of the fluid can be interesting to consider. Is the asterisk just part of the symbol? What's that? Is the asterisk yes, part of the it is. Okay. Yes. Right. Are there other questions about this so far? Okay, now I've put this in a little box to make it easier to find when you're working on the assignment. And so if we have now shear velocity and friction factor together, so we're substituting the shear velocity back into this relationship that tells us the Darcy-Wiesbach equation, then the fluid's flow velocity and the shear velocity of the fluid can be expressed as a function of the friction factor F. So you'll have some fun using this on the assignment. All right. Now, uh, we do have to wait a little bit before we get into all of the empirical equations for open channel flow. But since we're on the subject of flow resistance, let's look at how things are just a little bit different for an open channel than they are for a pipe. And uh, in engineered channels, and in fact in natural channels, uh, oftentimes we have this trapezoidal shape. Because um, it's, although it's easier to calculate the flow conditions in a rectangular channel, the fact is that a lot of the natural materials that are out there in the world can't support a rectangular channel like this. If you have water flowing through a rectangular channel, then the materials are going to just kind of slope uh, into the channel itself. You know, it collapse in. And so there, you could have a rock line channel, or if you had reinforced concrete, you could achieve a, tra uh, a rectangular channel. But this trapezoidal shape is more common. So the geometry of an open trapezoidal channel is pretty important uh, in this course. And so we call the bottom width of the channel lowercase b. The top width, depending on which resource you're using, like the FE manual and textbooks, all kind of uh, flip back and forth whether they call this T for top width or uppercase B. So I'll just let you know that uh, those two can be considered as interchangeable. There's one of the parameters is the bottom width, one of the parameters is the top width. And then there's some factor that relates the uh, slope, you know, how steep the side slope is. And so there's a vertical component a horizontal component, and if we say that this is one unit of vertical, and then we'd assign the side slopes to be like a t factor. So we could say t equals 2, and what that mean is for every one meter of rise in the side slope, there's two horizontal meters of length. Okay, so this is a pretty important uh, geometric parameter, and remember that shear stress can be approximated as the unit weight of the fluid, the hydraulic radius, which depends on the geometry, and then the slope of the energy grade line, S sub F. And hydraulic radius is the area divided by the wetted perimeter. And so the same kind of relationships exist in open channels and in enclosed pipes that relate flow resistance and flow rate. Um, but one of the differences here between what we were just talking about for pipes is that the slope of the channel and the slope of the energy grade line are equal if the flow conditions are steady and uniform. And so remember I said that the, the pipe slope and the energy grade line slope are independent for enclosed flow, and that's because it's pressurized. That's because the water's full to the very top of a pipe, and so the pipe can go up and down and it doesn't affect the energy grade line. But when there's air in contact with the channel, then the slope of the energy grade line is parallel to the slope of the uh, channel. So the two are equal if conditions are steady and uniform. 
Now just to get some early exposure to trapezoidal geometry, what's the hydraulic radius for a trapezoidal channel in terms of the bottom width and the depth of the channel? And so I want to know what is R. And so I'm going to pause uh, for a moment and give you time to calculate how can you express what is the, uh, the hydraulic radius of a channel in terms of uh, B, Y, and then I guess also this function T. So let me change this question in terms of B, Y, and T, which is the side slope. All right, so in other words, what we want to have is hydraulic radius is what? You know, how would you calculate the hydraulic radius for some B, Y, and T? And so what you have to do is just kind of look at this geometry of a trapezoid and figure out what is the area in terms of B, Y, and T. And then what's the wetted perimeter? Now the top of this, this is in contact with the air. So it doesn't count in wetted perimeter the top of the channel. So this uppercase B isn't a part of wetted perimeter. Wetted perimeter is only where the water is actually touching the material that's stationary, the solid material that's stationary. So we'd include this side angle length, the bottom width, and then the other side angle <coughs> length. All right, I'm going to give you a minute to uh, think through this. We want to know the area and wetted perimeter so we can calculate the hydraulic radius. Okay, um, so I was walking around and I think uh, people were either getting it or were on the right track. So let's look at this, uh, this trapezoidal geometry here. For a certain depth y, then there's going to be um, some extra width to the right on the top that is t times y. And the way to think of that maybe is with actual numbers. What if it was a 1 to 2 side slope? So if it was 1 to 2, that would mean however tall the water is, there would be twice as much width over on the right side and then also that same length over on the left side. So that's however, whatever the depth is times the t factor tells you the, the additional distance on the right across the top. So then with that, the area is b times y, which is the area of this rectangular section. So the width times the height. So that gives us the rectangle. And now we need to find these two triangles. If we combine the two triangles together, it's another rectangle with an area of ty times y. So that's where we get the cross-sectional area formula. And then for the wetted perimeter, what we have to do is we have to find these side lengths. And there's two of them. There's one on the left, one on the right. And so if this is ty is the top part of that triangle and y is the, uh, the height of it, then we have to square each side and find the square root. So the square root of y squared plus ty, which is squared, then there are two of them. So it is the, uh, the wetted perimeter is the bottom width and then two times these side lengths. So that uh, is given on page 301 if you want to make a note or revisit. I don't know if you already went over this. I'm having a hard time seeing where you got the, the ty to be the length. On the top? Uh, yeah. um, it's because by definition, t is however much width there is in this side slope angle for each unit of height. And so um, let's, I think it's most obvious if we, if we try it with real numbers. So let's say it is uh, 1 to 3 side. And then what if the depth of the water is 5. So if, if the depth of the water is 5, 5 is to 1, as this top width will be to 3. So this top width would have to be 15 if the depth was 5, because what we've defined is this, this angle is at such, a, it's at such an angle that um, for every unit of vertical, there's 3 units of horizontal. So then if we go back to the abstract again, if we say that we're just going to call this t, and then the depth is y, then that means however 
deep it is, there's t times that uh, there's t times that depth across the top. Yeah. Um, I was having problems with that. Mike pointed out that the bottom side was longer, and the way it was drawn, it was just throwing us off. But if you look at the actual picture, the T is actually longer on it. That helps you. Right. So you know the one, the water was longer. So you're saying that it just kind of makes more sense to you the if this is longer than well, one? Well, the drawing, because there it looks equal, like, yeah. it's a 45, 45. Yeah, this is definitely not to scale. Anytime yeah. I pick up a marker, you can guarantee it's not to scale. <laughs> and probably not legible, but... <laughs> okay, good point. Are there other questions about this one? Yeah. So can we think of the triangle as kind of like a slope ratio? Mm-hmm. Yep. It is. Slope ratio. That's a good way to put it. <coughs> Okay, um, so the Darcy Wiesbeck is kind of the, the gold standard that we, we use when we really care. Um, but back before it was convenient to do the, uh, the challenging calculations required to, to, to get an F value and before they'd characterized a lot of pipes to find out the information that goes in to the... Um, to the Darcy Wiesbach equation. One of the first empirical flow <coughs> resistance equations was the Chessy equation. And the Chessy equation says that there's a relationship between the hydraulic parameters that go into the hydraulic radius and the slope of the energy grade line with what the flow velocity is going to be in a channel or in an, an enclosed pipe as well. The Chessy equation can be used in either. And so there were these uh, Chessy roughness coefficients that were developed and you know the the error that's built in to using the Chessy equation is pretty large because in the same way that the Darcy Wiesbach equation does account for changes in um, flow conditions you remember that the um, the Hayes and Williams equation didn't last semester you calculated some C value that was supposed to be constant regardless of what the flow rate was regardless of the diameter and so on so here the Chessy equation is in a lot of ways similar to the uh, Hayes and Williams equation where a very rough pipe would have a low Chessy equation because you'd want the velocity to be low if it's a pipe material that's rough and if it's a very smooth material then the uh, C value would be much higher. Um, the Manning equation later improved on the Chessy equation and that is one equation that is still in use for open channel flow. Although the Manning equation isn't usually used for pressurized pipe flow. <clears throat> so uh, just a little bit of a history lesson that you know, there are simple and older equations to estimate empirical friction uh, effects and the Chessy is one of them. Now in your book on page 201 there's an equation that tells you how to relate the friction factor and the Chessy equation. And so, um, you know, in, in very rare cases, you may find infrastructure still in place that would de was designed back when the Chessy equation was utilized. And you think about uh, some of the older municipalities here in the eastern half of the United States. You know, some, there are pipe networks that have been in place for more than 100 years. And so you may find yourself looking at an old design drawing or some old design calculations that use the Chessy equation. And so if you needed to convert between the Chessy equation and the Darcy Wiesbach friction factor, this is the equation that you could use. And they're both based on a relationship of shear stress tied into the slope of the energy grade line. So that's where this equation is, uh, page 201 of your book. Okay, you remember um, that we've talked about velocity distributions before and that if the flow is moving slowly through a pipe, conditions are laminar. You know, if the, uh, if the Reynolds number is less than 2,000, then that means that the uh, laminar layers are slipping over each other without introducing a lot of turbulence. And this parabolic velocity distribution is a really smooth and regular way of predicting what's the velocity as a function of the radius from the uh, outside of the pipe. And so what we're looking at is this would be the bottom of the pipe where there's zero velocity because the water that's immediately in contact with the pipe 
remember, is experiencing the no-slip condition, where it can't move at some positive velocity over a surface that's causing resistance. Instead, the water velocity is zero at the pipe, and then the further away you get from the edge of the pipe, the velocity is increasing. And so this is the middle of the pipe, where there's the least amount of resistance, and if conditions are laminar, there would be a parabolic distribution of this curve. And then, of course, as you approach the other, the top of the pipe, the other side, then the velocity is decreasing again until it reaches zero at that top edge of the pipe. Turbulent flow conditions, instead of having this bullet-shaped velocity distribution, it's a flatter uh, edge. And that logarithmic shape means that now there's a lot of random variation. This would be kind of the average velocity over time. At any given time, one section may have a low velocity, some it may be higher, but over the average, it would be a logarithmic shape. There's a phrase that we call fully turbulent flow. And if we go back to the um, Moody diagram that we looked at in class last time, it differentiated between these two flow regions. The rough turbulent is also another way of, of saying fully turbulent flow and transitional flow. In the rough turbulent zone, what it means is the friction factor is not changing as the Reynolds number goes up. You know, past some certain threshold, you can continue to increase the flow velocity, and the, and the friction factor no longer depends on uh, an increasing velocity. The friction factor only depends on the relative roughness once you get into the rough turbulent zone. But on the other side of this rough turbulent zone, here in transition, or if the flow is not fully turbulent, then the friction depends both on the relative roughness and on the Reynolds number. So this is the same when we differentiate in the Moody diagram these two different zones. That's what we're continuing to talk about today uh, here with the idea of fully turbulent flow. And this sketch shows two different flow conditions. Um, a relatively slow moving flow where conditions are laminar and then turbulent flow. And this sketch is at the edge of the pipe where there's a lot of resistance. Then the, uh, the conditions, remember the velocity is low at the edge of the pipe. Going back to this, this sketch is a sketch of velocity. So here's the edge of the pipe at the bottom and the top. So low velocity means that there's going to be a lot of shear stress. The high shear stress in the fluid because that's right at the boundary where the, uh, the pipe is pressing against the fluid to resist its movement. This uh, boundary, uh, the thickness of the boundary layer um, can be thought of as the region where conditions are, where there's very little flow. The conditions are laminar throughout this boundary layer. But then the further away you get from the edge of the pipe, the shear stress is decreasing. And so um, there's two different conditions that are kind of summarized here. A condition where this is what the shear stress profile would look like for turbulent flow. Here's the shear stress distribution for laminar flow. It's how far into the pipe the shear stress is affecting conditions. And so if it's relatively low velocity through a pipe, then the shear stress doesn't extend out into the entire uh, cross-section of the pipe. So this top represents the center of the pipe, where you're the furthest away from the wall of the pipe, and so the shear stress is the lowest. The thickness of this boundary layer is important for a variety of reasons, and so um, what we're going to look at is some equations that calculate how thick is that boundary layer. The boundary layer depends on the uh, degree of turbulence and also the, the material of the pipe like what it's made of, is going to have an effect on how thick that boundary layer is. You can think of this boundary layer as kind of like a cushion. It's a fluid cushion at the edge of the pipe where conditions are laminar. And then when you get out of that boundary layer is where the flow conditions are with the, Re with the Reynolds number above 4,000, so the turbulent. So this is kind of just another way of looking at the velocity distribution. 
The fast flow velocity is going to uh, compress the boundary layer, where a slow velocity may have uh, the effect of increasing the boundary layer depth. Um, this is a table that can be found in your text that's describing different materials and their equivalent roughness. Uh, sometimes that's also called the equivalent sand roughness because what it's doing is it's comparing each of these different pipe materials into how much flow resistance there would be from a sand grain of uh, a certain diameter. So you can see that galvanized iron, the roughness and the effect of that roughness on moving water for new galvanized iron is the same as if you had some pipe that was lined with sand grains that had an average diameter of 0.15 millimeters. Uh, or if you had a wrought iron, a, a steel wrought iron pipe, it's more smooth and so you'd have to have a finer grain material to have the equivalent amount of um, resistance to flow. There are some pipe materials that have a very high equivalent roughness, particularly concrete that becomes rough over time if there's a chemical attack of the cement, then all that's left exposed in some concrete would be the, uh, the sand grains and then also like the aggregate. But um, sometimes in sewer pipes that can be a problem because um, in sewers there's a gas that's called hydrogen sulfide that's formed, it dissolves in the water and it forms sulfuric acid that can erode a concrete sewer pipe. And so uh, sometimes if you're designing the flow conditions assuming that you've got a really smooth newly manufactured concrete over time the material properties can change and then if the pipe becomes more rough because the cement is being, uh, uh, being dissolved out then that would mean it's less efficient for carrying flow. So it's kind of a, a, a compounding problem. I think it's kind of interesting to see that they've bothered to uh, figure out what's the equivalent roughness of wood pipes and I I don't know if there are any places still that have wood pipes in operation, but that's how they used to have water flowing through pipes with, in the same way that they have like barrels for uh, whiskey or for taking water from place to place. They'd have um, metal wiring going around the outside of, of pipes and so uh, that would be very labor intensive and I assume extremely prone to leaking. Um, on your assignment there is a a problem where you have to calculate how thick is the boundary layer for some certain flow conditions. And Morris and Wigert uh, together came up with an empirical equation that estimated how thick the boundary layer is based on the shear velocity. And you remember we just looked at the shear velocity equation uh, earlier. It's the ratio of the shear stress that the fluid is experiencing divided by the density of the fluid. And so here this little sketch is showing that uh, there can be different effects if the laminar thickness, if the, the thickness of the boundary layer fully encloses the roughness heights, then there can be one flow condition. Um, and we'd call that hydraulically smooth. So the, the limit is that if the, uh, if the boundary layer thickness is greater than 1.7 times the roughness, then we say that the laminar sublayer dominates the roughness elements and so it's therefore it's hydraulically smooth. So these little projections, you can think of them as, remember, it's almost like we're gluing sand particles to the inside of a pipe. These little particles are below that cushion. The laminar layer is where conditions, it's how thick conditions are laminar with the Reynolds number below 2000. But sometimes the uh, the laminar layer is very thin and the, uh, the roughness elements go beyond the thickness of that um, laminar sublayer and so that's hydraulically rough. Now you'll notice that there is a pretty big in between ground. You know hydraulically rough is if the laminar sublayer is less than 0 0.08 times the uh, equivalent roughness and hydraulically smooth has to be greater than 1.7 and so in between is a transition zone similar to how Reynolds number has this uh, 
transition zone between 2,000 and 4,000. So hydraulically smooth and hydraulically rough, these will come back again when, when we're actually doing some hydraulic calculations. We want to make assumptions, like we were looking for ways to simplify our calculations. We'll sometimes start off with a guess on whether conditions are hydraulically rough or hydraulically smooth. And so it'll be a way for us to, at the beginning, make an assumption that simplifies all of our calculations, and then we check to see if the assumption is true. So this is just a little bit of the theory that we'll use later on to uh, make it easier to finish calculations. OK, well, let's finish up today with one more calculation, one more example here. Let's say that we have an elevated water tank that's provided water to a building. And you can see from the, uh, from the problem statement that we're delivering 12,000 liters per minute. And at the ground floor of this office building, we want to make sure that uh, the pressure is 350 kilopascals. And we know the pipe length is 250 meters long, and the diameter is 250 meters. And the friction loss is 16.4 meters. So if you know the friction loss, then that, in effect, is going to tell you what elevation you need to have inside the tank to be able to deliver the water. So in other words, uh, H sub F, in this example, we're going to assume that all of the head losses are due to pipe friction. So H sub L is H sub F. We'll neglect the minor losses in this case. And the problem statement tells us that they are altogether 16.4 meters. OK, so in part A, I'd like you to use the energy equation and solve for Z1. Find out how tall does the water have to be inside of that elevated tank to make it all work so that we have enough pressure so that we come over the uh, friction losses. And um, let's assume that you are accounting for the velocity head at 2. But at 1, since that's, an, that's a tank, you know, a reservoir of water, we'll assume that the velocity inside of the tank is 0. So you'll be able to cancel out the velocity head at 1. And then once you uh, have that solved, calculate the uh, friction factor that accounts for how much friction loss we're seeing. So in this case, we'll be solving for f with the given, all the other given parameters. And then I'd like you to get a chance to practice out the, uh, the thickness of the boundary layer inside the pipe with the Morris and Wigert criteria. And let me bring, I'll try and copy that over from the uh, previous one. Here's the Morris and Wigert. I'll paste this into the example. All right, so I'm going to stop talking. You can work with your classmates, collaborate on this one, and we'll revisit. Make sure we're all getting the same numbers. By the way, I added all of the equations in one place um, so that you don't necessarily have to flip through the notes for part C. OK, uh, in part A, we're calculating how high the water has to be in the tank. Part B, we want to ask, what's the friction factor that's causing this friction loss? In part C, we're just getting some practice with the uh, thickness of the boundary layer. OK, so uh, here's the solution to calculate the uh, elevation of the water in that reservoir on the left. We have to do some of the preliminary stuff at the beginning, like calculate what's the flow rate, not in terms of liters per minute, but what is in meters cubed per second, because we're going to need to calculate the velocity of the water that's flowing through the pipe because although we're going to cancel out the uh, velocity head at 1, at 2, we're taking that to be the, uh, the pipe just before it gets to the building. And so it still has velocity head when the water's in the pipe just before it gets to the building. OK, so you can see all the substitutions that I've made into the energy equation. P1 is 
zero since we're at the free surface of the water inside of the tank. Z1 is what we're solving for. The velocity of the water inside the tank is zero. P2 is the pressure that we're trying to achieve at the bottom floor of that building. Z2 is the given elevation from the sketch. You can see that the elevation above our datum is 20 meters for the building. And then we've got the velocity head and the given head loss. And so when you rearrange everything and solve for Z1, it should be 72.9 meters. And you may get slightly different values depending on uh, how many digits you take the velocity head to on, uh, on the right. Any questions about part A, how we calculated the uh, required height of that tank? All right, so now when you're given the darcy Weisbach equation and all of these terms are already defined in the problem, we, we have a known head loss, a known pipe length, the flow velocity can be calculated, the diameter, we can just rearrange that to solve for the friction factor F and it'll be 0 0.0194. And now uh, this last part is maybe the tricky stuff here because uh, before I put the equation on the screen you had to remember what is the slope of the energy grade line S sub F because you're going to have to put that into the equation that relates shear stress and slope of the energy grade line. Um, so the slope of the energy grade line is the head loss relative to the pipe length. And so here we've got the slope of the energy grade line as a fraction. And if we substitute that into the shear stress equation, we can find that the shear stress is about 40.2 newtons per meter squared. Did uh, everybody get that for the shear stress? Yep. OK. Now, we want the shear velocity. Now that we have the shear stress, we can express the shear stress in terms of meters per second by taking the shear stress, divide by the density, and the square root. So the shear velocity is 0.2 meters per second. And now we put it into this Morrison-Wigert equation to find the thickness of the boundary layer. So it's 11.6 times the kinematic viscosity of water and then divide by the shear velocity. So it turns out the thickness of the boundary layer under these flow conditions, it's going to be 0 0.058 millimeters. And so then what we could do if we knew more about the pipe is we could look and see what's the equivalent roughness. And then we could see are those roughness elements fully submerged by the laminar layer and therefore we have you know, rough turbulent flow or do we have um, smooth flow or is it in the transition zone. But I think that uh, this example should be pretty good practice for the assignment that's due on Tuesday. Are there any questions related to the example before we wrap up? Yeah. I use the ratio velocity over the uh, velocity over shear velocity equals the square root of 8 over your friction factor in order to find that shear velocity to be star, mm -hmm. and was able to come out with the same, with the same So, uh, not this star. one. One of the early, earlier equations that we had. Yes. Which, which one? The velocity over shear velocity equals square root of 8 over the friction factor. Right? Okay. Is in the box. There, this one. Yeah. Yeah. This works if you know the F value. And in this example, you did. Okay. Yeah, you knew the F value. Yeah, so you can use that and then sure. you know the F value. Yep. Okay. The F value was a proxy for, uh, for everything else. Right. All right. Uh, before we wrap up, let's just glance one last time at these announcements. The assignment uh, zero is due tomorrow by 11. And homework one, please upload it to MU Online before class on Tuesday. Hope you have a good long weekend. I'll see you next week.